Welcome back guys. In this video, we're looking at triple integrals. This is our last video on triple integrals. Um, and we're given a problem, we're given a triple integral, <coughs> and we're asked to convert it to both cylindrical and spherical coordinates. And then we're asked to evaluate the simplest integral. Um, I thought this was a great way to wrap up this topic um, by just showing you how we would evaluate or how we would um, switch an integral written in rectangular coordinates to both um, cylindrical and spherical coordinates. Um, but let's, let's just recap how this process works in general. If you have the triple integral over Q of some function of X, Y, and Z, and we're integrating over a solid region, so there's a DV over here, there are basically three things that you need when you're switching from one coordinate system to another. You need bounds in your new coordinate system. So bounds in the new coordinates. So that might be R theta and Z or it might be rho, theta, and phi. You need an integrand in the new coordinates. So again, that might be r, theta, and z, or rho, theta, and phi. <coughs> and lastly, you need dv in the new coordinates. In cylindrical coordinates, This is, this can be written this way. Cylindrical coordinates, we're just taking dA from polar coordinates, that was r dr d theta, and you're multiplying by a change in z, so you multiply by dz. In spherical coordinates, I didn't prove it to you yet, but we'll prove it and when we learn about um, the Jacobian next week. dv happens to be rho squared sine of phi times d rho d theta d phi. Um, so we need dv in terms of the new coordinate system, we need the integrand in terms of the new coordinate system, and we need bounds in terms of the new coordinate system. Um, so that's exactly what we're going to do for this function. Um, but in order to do that, in order to get the bounds, the first thing we have to do, the first thing we always have to do is sketch that um, solid region Q that we're integrating over. Now this time they didn't tell us the equations of the surfaces, but the equations of the surfaces are, are built into this statement right here. This is telling me that Z goes from here to here, and y, while Y goes from here to here, and X goes from here to here. So we're going to use the bounds for our original integral to um, sketch the solid region, and then we will describe that solid region in both cylindrical and spherical coordinates. <coughs> so let's start by stating the appropriate bounds. Okay. So remember, the innermost bounds go with the innermost variable. So z ranges from four to four plus that square root. And this second set of bounds goes with that middle variable. So y goes from this negative square root to the positive square root there. And the final bounds, I'm just going to go through this because I've run out of space. Those are the bounds for x. So x goes from negative 4 to 4. All right, so we've stated the bounds for x, y, and z. And now we want to sketch the corresponding surfaces. 
or sketch the, the corresponding solid region Q. And the way we sketch Q is we think of each of these, um, or at least these two functions here, as a bottom surface and a top surface. So one of the surfaces is just Z equals four. And that's just a plane. We've got up four units. So it's parallel to the xy plane, because that's z equals zero down here. But z is equal to four up here. Okay. So z is going from four to something else. Z equals four plus the square root of 16 minus x squared minus y squared. Okay, so now I'd like to take this equation of a surface and rewrite it so that it looks more like the surfaces that I've already studied. So I'll subtract 4 from both sides. And we'll square both sides to get rid of the square root. Now we have z minus 4 squared equals 16 minus x squared minus y squared. Then add the x squared and y squared to both sides. And we get this. Now you might be saying, oh, that's cool. That's a sphere. It is a sphere. But be careful. Because of this, we have a restriction on the range. We don't get the whole sphere. This tells us that z is equal to four plus something that is non-negative. This is positive or possibly zero. So this tells me that z is greater than or equal to four. So I've got a sphere, but I just want the part of this sphere where z is greater than or equal to four. So let's identify the center of the sphere. We're not subtracting anything from the x or y, so the x and y coordinates of the center are zero and zero. We are subtracting four from the z. So the center is 0, 0, 4. And the radius squared is 16. So if I take the square root of that, I get the radius, that's 4. So this is a circle, or a sphere, excuse me, centered at 0, 0, 4. So it's centered right here. And the radius is 4. So we go up 4. And normally we would go down 4, but we're not going down 4 because z is greater than or equal to 4. Um, and then we're going to go back 4 and forward four, and left four, and right four. So let's go up to eight. <coughs> Excuse me. We end up with something that looks like this. Okay, so we've got a hemisphere, but it's, it's raised up four units. It's kind of odd. That's cool. Okay. So Z ranges from here to here. Let's see if we get the whole thing. We might get the entire solid region in between those two. Now we're going to look at the rest of these bounds. These tell us the projection of our solid region onto the XY plane. I think we do get the whole, um, the whole hemisphere. And, and let me show you why. Um, So I've got y equals the negative square root of 16 minus x squared, that's one bound, and y equals the positive square root of 16 minus x squared, that's the other bound. Now if you square both of these and then rearrange the equations, you get 16 minus x squared equals y squared and 16 minus x squared equals y squared. If you rearrange these even further, you get x squared plus y squared equals 16 and x squared plus y squared equals 16. Say, okay, well, what is the difference between those two? Well, on this one, y was allowed to be negative. So y was less than or equal to zero. On this one, y was a positive square root, so y was greater than or equal to zero. Put those two pieces together and you get both halves of the circle. So this is a circle of radius four centered at the origin. <clears throat> Excuse 
excuse me. Okay, so y goes from here to here. And then we are told that x goes from negative four to four. So we get the whole um, circle. So that projection onto the xy plane is this. Now I know that most of the examples we've done will give you a whole circle. It wouldn't necessarily have to be that way. We might not get the whole hemisphere. If, if x went from 0 to 4, we would just get the half over here where x is positive. We get that half that's closest to us. Or if x went from negative 4 to 0, we get the half that's behind the x or the yz plane over there. Um, but this time, we have this entire solid. That's q. And the projection onto the xy plane is r. It's right down there. Okay, so now we've got options. Now that we have, we've sketched Q and we've sketched the region R, we can do this in both cylindrical coordinates and spherical coordinates. Um, <coughs> notice we also have an integrand of X. Okay, so let's do cylindrical coordinates first. So in cylindrical coordinates, these bounds for z that we started with would immediately be converted to um, functions of r and theta. So z would still go from 4 to 4 plus the square root, but we would replace x squared plus y squared with r squared because that's what happens in cylindrical coordinates. So these bounds get replaced with these bounds. Okay, okay, now we look at the region R. And we would describe this region R in cylindrical coordinates. That's just giving us values for R and theta. R goes from 0 out to 4. Because remember, R equals 0 is a point at the origin. R equals 1 is a circle of radius 1. R equals 4 is a circle of radius 4. So if I want that solid disk, R goes from zero to four. And if I get the whole disk, so I go, that, that angle theta sweeps all the way around the xy plane. I only want to trace that out once. Theta goes from zero to two pi. Okay, so we had this triple integral over Q of x dv, and we want to write it in um, cylindrical coordinates. So we need new bounds, and we found them right here. We have to integrate with respect to z before we integrate with respect to r, because the bounds for z depend on r. Otherwise, there's no requirement as far as the order is concerned. And then x in cylindrical coordinates, x has the same conversion formula as it had in polar coordinates. x is just r cosine of theta. So we did our thing. We got new bounds. And we've got a new integrand, which just happened to be x. And then we need a new dv. In cylindrical coordinates, dv is dz times dA from polar coordinates, which is dz times r dr d theta. And that's actually the order of integration that I want. So I'm going to multiply this integrand that I have by an r. So I'll get an r squared there integrate with respect to z, then r, and then theta. So that's one option. So this is both my integrand, my new integrand, times my dv, and I simplified it. Okay. 
or so we could evaluate that if we want to. This is one option. Let's say, do we want to evaluate that? Maybe. Now, or the other option is to, to describe this region differently. Because it's part of a sphere, maybe it would be easier to describe in spherical coordinates. Um, in order to do that, I think I would take this version and expand it and simplify it a little bit. So I'm taking this version of the equation of a sphere, of our sphere, sphere centered at 0, 0, 4, and I will square that z minus 4. I mean, I know it's already squared, but we want to expand it and simplify it. The reason we want to do that is because I want to see that x squared plus y squared plus z squared, which I can substitute with a row squared. z times z is z squared. There's my row squared. That's exactly what I wanted. Minus 4z minus another 4z is minus 8z. Negative 4 times negative 4 is 16. Subtract 16 from both sides. Add 8z to both sides. And now we've got x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals 8z. And x squared plus y squared plus z squared is rho squared. And z is rho cosine of phi in cylindrical, or excuse me, in spherical coordinates. Now, because the simplified equation will include the possibility that rho equals 0, we can divide out rho equals 0, or we can divide out rho and we get rho equals 8 cosine of phi. Okay, so that's one bound. You say, okay, well, rho goes from what to what? Well, it doesn't, rho doesn't go from zero to that bound anymore. We start at this plane and we go to this sphere. So we've got to describe the plane z equals four somehow in spherical coordinates. Now this is not a good candidate for spherical coordinates. It's not too bad, <coughs> but I'm not a huge fan. Okay. Um, so if I am solving this for rho, I would divide both sides by cosine of phi, and I get rho um, equals four times secant of phi, because one over cosine is secant. Now we have to be careful. Let's look at this picture. What will our bounds for phi be? We're starting on the positive z-axis and going to a plane that's parallel to the xy plane. So phi is going to go from 0 to pi over 2. that worry you? Worries me. See the problem is um, at pi over 2, oh, we're going to be in trouble. Um, at pi over 2, we would be dividing by 0. So it's a bit of a problem. Um, theta still goes from 0 to 2 pi. And say, okay, well, let's just treat it as an improper integral. And phi goes from this lower bound, the plane z equals 4, to this upper bound. Oh, sorry. The lower bound was 4 secant of phi. The upper bound was the sphere, that's 8 cosine of phi. Okay, so we've got new bounds. We need new bounds, we need a new integrand, and we need a new dv. So we've got the triple integral over q of x dv, and our bounds look like this. Theta goes from zero to two pi. Phi goes from 0 to pi over 2, which is a bit of a problem because the bounds for rho are not defined there. And rho goes from 
4 secant of phi to 8 cosine of phi. <coughs> so I got my new bounds. I also need a new integrand in terms of rho, theta, and phi. Well, in spherical coordinates, x is rho times sine of phi times cosine of theta. Okay, that's not so bad. And now you need a new dv, which we did not prove yet, but I'll show you when we study the Jacobian. dv is rho squared sine of phi times d rho d theta, or I've done d phi d theta. So it's your dv in spherical coordinates. So we would simplify. And remember, this is improper. We're going to have to let theta approach pi over 2 from the right. No, from the left, my other right. Rho times rho squared is rho cubed. Sine times sine is sine squared. And I've got cosine of theta, d rho d phi d theta. So that's the integral in spherical coordinates. And then we also had the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the integral from 0 to 4 of the integral from 4 to 4 plus the square root of 16 minus r squared of r squared cosine of theta dz dr d theta in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, and remember what this is. Well, it's, it's a triple integral of x, and who knows what x represents. Maybe it's mass, or maybe it's um, density. But it's a triple integral of x over this um, solid region Q. So we're integrating x over this, in this space, um, over this solid region. And that's what we get. Which one would you rather evaluate? I think I want to do this one, even though it has this square root. At least it's not an improper integral where uh, phi would have to approach pi over 2 from the left. That's what we'd have to do up here. Also, I see a lot more trig functions, uh, quite a few more trig functions. Now, because of this square root, we might end up having to do a trig sub. And through doing the trig sub, we might end up with something that looks the same as what we got over there anyway. Um, this and, and see how it goes. So I think between the two of these I'd rather do the integral and cylindrical coordinates. So let's do this integral and cylindrical coordinates. We're just going to start on the inside and work our way out. So we have the integral from 0 to 2 pi of the integral from 0 to 4. <coughs> now there's no z here. So when we anti-differentiate this with respect to z, we just get r squared cosine of theta, which is a constant, times z evaluated from z equals 4 to z equals 4 plus the square root of 16 minus r squared. And then we integrate that result with respect to r and theta. So factor out the r squared cosine of theta. And then we do the upper bound minus the lower bound for z. That's f of b minus f of a, the fundamental theorem of calculus. The fours reduce. That's nice. And I have um, cosine of theta, which is a constant times r squared times the square root of 16 minus r squared. Hmm, that's not so bad. 
I think we can do integration by parts with that, integration by parts with a U sub. I know it's going to seem a little bit tricky, sort of a fancy integration by parts, um, but it's nothing we can't handle. You have all the skills to evaluate this integral. So here's the idea. Um, if this was just an R times the square root of 16 minus R squared, I could integrate that with a U substitution, but it's not. It's an R squared times that. So that means it's a little trickier. So this is what I'm going to do to get around it. I'm going to take that R squared and I'm going to factor it. I'm going to call that R times R times the square root of 16 minus R squared. And then I'll use integration by parts to evaluate this integral. And I'll let u equal r and dv equal that. The reason I chose dv to be this is because I can anti-differentiate this with a u sub. And the derivative of that is just a 1. So I know it's going to, uh, doing this will make my integral simpler. <coughs> Even if it doesn't look like it's simpler at, at first, it will eventually be simpler. So we'll let u equal r and we'll compute du. Derivative of r is 1, so we get 1 times dr. dv is r times 16 minus r squared to the 1 half power dr, and v is the antiderivative of that. If you want to, you can do this as scratch work. v is the antiderivative of r times 16 minus r squared to the 1 half dr. Let's let w equal the inside function. I don't want to use u because we're using it for something else. Then dw is negative 2r dr. I don't need the negative 2, so we'll divide both sides by 2. And this is what I get. r dr is negative 1 half dw. And then this is w to the 1 half. So we Add 1 to the exponent and then divide by the new exponent. Dividing by 3 halves is the same as multiplying by 2 thirds. Normally we'd get a plus c. We won't use a plus c um, here when we're doing the integration by parts, but we will back substitute um, w with 16 minus r squared. So we'll have a negative 1 third times 16 minus r squared to the 3 halves power. <coughs> oh, I think we're still going to be stuck with a trig sub. That's okay. So according to integration by parts, we get u times v minus the integral of v to u. And since there's no theta here, this is all constant with respect to theta, we could actually factor that out. We could make this to the integral from 0 to 2 pi of cosine of theta d theta. And then we're multiplying that by the integral from 0 to 4 of all of that over there. And actually, let's see what we get from the integration by parts. We get u times v. minus the integral of v. So I'm subtracting a negative one third, so it's gonna be adding one third. du. And we're evaluating all of this from zero to four for r. Uh, and I think I'm going to be able to avoid something. I'm going to be able to avoid some work. This would require a trig sub. We'd have to let r equal 4 um, times sine of theta and do trigonometric substitution. Um, but it, remember, this is multiplied by this. The antiderivative of cosine is sine. Substitute in 0 and 2 pi, and you get sine of 2 pi minus sine of 0 times that integral that I don't care to evaluate. That's 0 minus 0, so we get 0 times something, which is, of course, 0. That saved us a bunch of time. If this was non-zero, I would have to evaluate this using integration or using trigonometric substitution. And usually, we go to polar coordinates to get away from that um, 
But even when we went to um, cylindrical coordinates to set up this integral, um, we couldn't get away from the trigonometric substitution here, unfortunately. But that was zero, so it zeroed everything out, and we get zero. Okay, guys. <coughs> so let's let's talk through this just one more time. If you're given an integral in rectangular coordinates and you're asked to convert to cylindrical or spherical coordinates, you're going to do the same thing. Um, this, it's pretty much the same thing that you did when you converted from rectangular to polar coordinates. You need new bounds, bounds in terms of the new coordinates. So either r theta and z or rho theta and phi. And you need a new integrand. That has to be written in terms of your new coordinates, r theta and z or rho theta and phi. And your dv has to be written in the appropriate coordinate system. This one we derived, it's just dA from polar coordinates times dz. This one we haven't derived yet, but we will using the Jacobian. Um, we need that volume piece. Once you find the new bounds, the new integrand, and the new dV, you just substitute and you evaluate the integral. Now, if you're saying to yourself, how do you actually find those bounds? The first thing we do is we take the stated bounds so I say z, the bounds for the innermost variable go right here. z goes from here to here, y goes from here to here, and x goes from here to here. And I write those down, and then I start sketching. Now the bounds for z, especially if they are written first, like z is going from a function to a function, that's where I start. So I start with z equals four, that's a plane. And then I have z equals this, which looks a mess, but it also, because of the square root and all the squares, it, it looks like one of my quadric surfaces. So I realize what this positive square root does to the z values. It gives me a, a range restriction. And then I solve this, or I rewrite this equation until it looks like something I'm familiar with. Turns out it's a sphere centered at this point with this radius. So I sketch the surface, and I sketch the surface, and I sketch that right over here. Now we're not necessarily guaranteed the z all of the um, all of the volume between those two surfaces to figure out what which part of the volume between those two surfaces we get we have to look at the projection onto the xy plane now it turned out when we projected onto the xy plane we had a circle of radius four so we actually did get all of the volume between those two surfaces but if there was any difference down here if we were just talking about this piece or maybe one half of the circle or something like that, it would affect the, the solid region Q that we're integrating over. Okay, so you sketch Q, you sketch R, you use that to figure out uh, what your um, solid region looks like. And then if you are going to cylindrical coordinates, this is what we do. We write our bounds for Z as functions of r and theta. We look at the projection onto the xy plane and describe that in terms of r and theta, which when you get the whole circle, not that half circle that I just highlighted. Um, r goes from 0 to 4 and theta goes from 0 to 2 pi. So you get that over here. Um, so now you've got these new bounds. Then you need the bounds in terms of your new variables, your integrand in terms of the new variables, which is just in our case an identity. Um, if it wasn't, if this was you know, 3x times y squared, I'd replace x with four, um, r cosine theta, y with r sine theta, and simplify. So it might be much more complicated than this next time. But you get a new integrand and you replace your dv with the appropriate dv and that's your integral. Spherical coordinates is not as straightforward. In cylindrical coordinates, all we had to do was convert the equation for the surface for z here and here into functions of r and theta, and then look at the projection. Spherical coordinates are a little bit trickier. We said, okay, z goes from here to here. How do I write the equation for z equals four in spherical coordinates? And how do I write the equation for this sphere, this hemisphere that we're looking at in spherical coordinates? So I take the equation of the hemisphere and I rewrite it. And I'm trying to get an x squared plus y squared plus z squared because I know that rho squared is equal to x squared plus y squared plus z squared. So we write this twice, we FOIL, 
until we see something that we can substitute, that we substitute it. And then this is going to happen generally. You'll have that row or that R on both sides. You can divide by it because there are certain values of the angle over here that will give you the, the value that you need over here. Like there are values of, of phi that will give me a, a row equals zero. Um, and the same is true when you're looking at R. <coughs> you can divide out R, you can divide out phi, or excuse me, you can divide out R and you can divide out rho um, because this trigonometric equation has rho equals zero, that thing you divide it out as one of its solutions. Okay, so anyway, you take the equation of the sphere and you write it um, differently. You write it in terms of uh, rho, theta, and phi. You take the equation of the plane and you write it in terms of rho, theta, and phi. And then you have to look for bounds for theta and phi. You look at the projection onto the xy plane, the bounds for theta in spherical coordinates are the same as the bounds for theta in um, cylindrical coordinates. And then you look up here. It's a little strange, but it's, that's how you do it. Um, phi starts on the positive z-axis, and it, it's a, an angle that sort of sweeps down. It goes from like some point here, and then it's sweeping down. Or actually, it's going to look like this to you from your perspective. It's sweeping down. Um, <coughs> well, in order to get that sphere, um, theta is, or phi is going to sweep from 0 to pi over 2. And then theta goes from 0 to 2 pi, and that's how we get the whole thing. Okay, so you've got these bounds here. And then what do you do? You need an integrand in terms of rho, theta, and phi, so we just substituted our identities for x, y, and z. We substitute those to get a new integrand, and then you replace dv with this, and then you simplify. And then you say to yourself, would I rather integrate this or this? Um, so that's how we write integrals in spherical or cylindrical coordinates. Um, yeah, you just need a new integrand, a new dv, and new bounds. But finding the new bounds really comes down to drawing those surfaces and then using your sketch to infer the bounds for theta and phi and using your equations and your coordinate conversion equations to write um, these equations of surfaces like z equals four and z equals six, four plus the square root of 16 minus x squared minus y squared. Use those equations to write those in terms of r and theta or in terms of um, theta and phi like we do up here, rho, theta, and phi.